Dear We Empower members and friends, welcome to the webinar. Today's topic, preparing for an automated future, key consideration for attracting and strengthening the talent at women at work. The webinar is hosted by the We Empower G7 team in collaboration with the Institute for Women's Policy Research to explore how to achieve gender equality in light of an increasingly automated workplace and its impact on attracting and retaining female talent. Promoting Economic Empowerment for Women at Work in G7 Countries is a program funded by European Union and implemented by UN Women and the International Labour Organization. My name is Diana Russo and I will be moderating the discussion today. On behalf of UN Women, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for spending the next hour with us. Together with our panelists, we will analyze the good practice in the US and the European Union to attract and recruit and retain female talent and prepare women for long-term careers in artificial intelligence and STEM-related industries. And of course, we will try to explore the future trends to help employers anticipate decisions that need attention in order to invest financial and human resources more strategically in the 21st century workplace. Here is our agenda for today. We hope to have more time for Q&A session so we can have a rich discussion and we will need your help in this. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can enter your question into the question box for the organizer or the panelists to answer. We are promising to take in the most um, interesting one and the most uh, questions that are coming into the repeating order, and we will do our best to respond as much as possible to the all numbers of the question that we will receive. The Institute for Women Policy Research, based in Washington, launched a new publication, Women Automation and the Future of Work. I would like to invite Ariane Hegewisch, Program Director, Employment and Earnings, Institute for Women Policy Research, to share about the findings and recommendations. Ariane is responsible for Institute research on earnings, occupation and workplace, discrimination, and directs the Institute works for the U.S. Department of Labor, Gender Equity, and Apprenticeship Grants, and co-directs Institute's programs on women and the future of work. Recent publication includes Women Automation and the Future of Work and the Pathways to Equity, Narrowing the Wage Gap by Improving Women's Access to Good Middle Skills Job. Ariane was a member of the 2015-2016 Equals Employment Opportunities Commission Select Task Force on Workplace Harassment. Dear Ariane, thank you for this collaboration. Passing over to you, and we all are looking forward to know more about the publication. Um. Good morning. Could I have the first slide, please? Thank you so much for this opportunity to um, present a very brief summary of um, our new research on women automation and the future of work. We are an independent research institute here in Washington and would um, really like to thank JP Morgan Chase and Co. for supporting this research. Um, our work is based on the U.S. labor market in U.S. institutions, but I think it's um, relevant more broadly. The reason we started this research is because in the United States there was a lot of discussion about the future of work and driverless cars and um, peopleless factories. Uh, and in the United States, women typically are not drivers or truck drivers, and manufacturing un uh, employment has declined a lot for women in the past few years. So really, we wanted to figure out what um, these trends mean for women. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, and here, really, to start with our three reasons why we think, the main reasons why we think we need a gender lens when we look at the future of work. The first one is occupational segregation. 
Uh, women and men often do very different types of work. Um, women do work in healthcare, um, men work more in production, utilities, and, and STEM. So um, we thought we needed to start with where women and men work, and we're drawing on a methodology developed by UK researchers, Brian Osborne, which assigns risk of um, occupational replacement and technology to each um, of the US uh, big occupations. Uh, and we also wanted to look at the changing trend in the need for working with digital media and um, computers, and again, their focus on the occupations in which women and men work. Um, the second point, nothing surprising to this group, it's family care work. Women do more unpaid work at home than men, and this reduces um, the options for taking part in paid work. Uh, the need for such work is growing rapidly because of aging, and hence particularly um, women, and particularly older women, may face even more need for care work unless we do more on policy. Uh, and the third one is that we are entering the future, i.e. now, with profound gender and racial ethnic inequalities, and we know that such inequalities are economically costly. Hence, our concerns for what are the future opportunities um, for reducing such inequalities. Next slide, please. So, just to give you our results in a nutshell so that you can sit back and relax. So, what we found is firstly, women, and particularly Hispanic women in the US, are much more likely than men to work in the occupations at the highest risk of automation. Um, the second difference from men is that risk, um, the risk for automation um, for women's occupation is particularly high in the better skilled jobs, um, in the better paid jobs, uh, which potentially may reduce the steps into the middle class for women. Um, and the third one is that we found that women are actually more likely than men to work with digital technologies, um, but their share of the most skilled digital, digital stocks, um, jobs, IT jobs, is falling. Now, a little bit more work in detail. Next slide, please. So um, here is a slide which distributes the workforce by men and women between those working in jobs with a very high risk of um, technological substitution, 90% or higher in the next um, 10 to 15 years, uh, and those in the very um, low risk jobs. Um, women outnumber men substantially. Three in 10 women compared with two in um, 10 men are in very high risk occupations, and these include um, a lot of office work, secretaries and administrative work, bookkeepers, accounting, as well as lower wage jobs such as cashiers, cooks, um, uh, shop staff, uh, and waiters. Um, Hispanic women are particularly likely to work in such jobs, more than three in uh, more than a third of um, Hispanic women. Uh, women also outnumber men in the safer jobs, um, the ones that are not likely to be um, substituted by technology. Um, those jobs typically require at least a university degree, um, but being in a safe job doesn't necessarily mean that it is a good job. And in the US, often issues about employment security and edge, um, access to benefits can be high in those jobs. Next slide, please. Next slide. So um, as I said, we also look at the changing um, need to work with digital technologies, which is defined as having to work with computers and knowing about computers. Um, what this graph shows uh, is the distribution of men and women's employment according to the intensity of um, the need of working with digital media. Um, what it shows is unsurprising at one level is that in those jobs that are most directly focused on um, digitalization, the jobs, the IT jobs and STEM jobs, women are underrepresented. 
However, at least currently, that is not a big sector of um, employment. Women are much uh, more likely than men, however, to work in jobs that need quite a high level of computing and digital skills. Um, and they're underrepresented at the uh, lowest end. Um, next slide. Um, what we were then interested in is how much working with digital content improves pay. And what we did is we mapped women's and men's individual employment um, based on their occupational characteristics uh, against an index of um, the need for digital media and median annual earnings. And for both men and women, um, earnings are highest at the highest level of digital um, um, content and their lowest at the lowest level. But the um, returns to working with digital contents are very different for women and men. Um, and they are much higher for men. There's a big wage gap and it's particularly large in the, um, in, in the fields where most women work. Um, this is controlled for education. So it does reflect that women um, are secretaries and this is a you know, declining occupation, but it also includes um, HR specialists, teachers, post-secondary teachers, um, nurses, laboratory assistants, lots of different jobs. Uh, and the, there is a big wage gap there and we do not know whether this is because women are less likely to produce the technology of the future, they're in the consuming technology jobs, or whether it's an older story that when women do a lot of jobs, um, when, or when women do jobs, they get less rewards for those um, than men. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, there's one, um, one back, please. Okay. So then what we looked at is women's representation specifically in the largest IT occupations, computer scientists, software developers, and computer support specialists. And what we found is that yes, women are underrepresented in those occupations, but since 2000, women's representation has fallen further uh, in each of these large occupations. And it's not that not more women now are working in those fields than they did in, in 2000. However, men are joining these occupations even um, in even greater numbers. Uh, and women's underrepresentation here means not only that they aren't in the highest paid jobs, it also means that they're not there when the future is designed and implemented. Next slide. So finally, um, what all this means is the future is uncertain. We don't know what the new jobs will be or at what speed all jobs will be replaced. But what we do know, because it's uncertain, policy matters and women need to be un, uh, at the table and we need to consider and take into consideration for policy that women and men have different opportunities, different levels of time to um, take the steps that will allow them to benefit from future um, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arian. It's a lot of information to um, to to now uh, think about and also to think about what are the real causes of this underrepresentation and what is the future design for women? Um, do we speak about retention? Do we speak about uh, uh, the reintegration, education? All of that, I hope we can discuss in the Q&A session. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I would like to invite the next panelist, Sasha Pezuhanova, Founder and Chairperson um, of MOVE.BG and Governing Board Member of European Institute of Innovation and Technology and Board Chair of Bulgarian Center of Women in Technologies. Sasha is a Senior Executive Angel Investor and Philanthropist with a 20 years executive business career in HP and the multidimensional track records of service to society. 
a long list of business achievements and social development engagement throughout the years involves uh, positioning Bulgaria as an ICT center of global significance, boosting the entrepreneurial culture and women empowerment in Bulgaria and at European level. Sasha, we are looking forward to know more about your work and about policies implemented in Bulgaria and in European Union. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really uh, want uh, uh, to thank you for this opportunity to share my opinion. And I'll look to the topic from a little bit different perspective, hopefully contributing to the uh, discussion and uh, uh, to uh, provoking you thinking on the topic and challenge that we have with women's involvement in the digital era. If we uh, look to the process uh, um, from a little bit more holistic perspective, uh, I hope you agree with me that uh, women's active involvement in the societal process and women's human rights are for quite some time on the world's agenda. There are movements against home violence, uh, activist campaigns against existing practices like child marriages or uh, female uh, mutilation, and also lots of initiatives in support of women's voting rights uh, and the uh, right of uh, inheritance. And a lot has been achieved uh, already throughout the years, uh, although they are unprivileged uh, uh, women in quite some geographies in the world. The thing is, though, that all those important initiatives position uh, the woman as a victim. And uh, such a motivational perspective, uh, in a way, continues to fit the division between men and uh, women in the society. Uh, the rationale should be different. Next slide, Pete, please. Next slide. Anyway, I continue. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, because uh, uh, we need uh, really the talent of both women and men to be activized, mobilized uh, in the society, and uh, uh, we have complementary skills uh, that are needed. Uh, and uh, if, uh, of course, uh, we look uh, in what companies and governments are doing, uh, I hope you agree with me that uh, uh, the topic for women's uh, professional participation and uh, women, uh, women's right, uh, it is a uh, really central theme uh, for the world leadership, both on a corporate as also on the uh, formal leadership level. And uh, uh, this, though, uh, has an economic uh, uh, reason and background because we are living, uh, next slide please, we are living in a digitally connected world uh, where uh, every business is digitally empowered uh, and we saw from the data what are the uh, trends that was introduced by Irene. And uh, leadership needs to be digitally conscious uh, for uh, this trend and to be able to drive the corporations as per the standards of the tomorrow's world. The world needs more digital professionals, uh, professionals uh, that are equipped and qualified to create solutions for the futures. And uh, only in Europe, uh, there is a need of 700,000 uh, uh, digital jobs uh, that are not uh, fit yet, and uh, on a work basis, um, uh, this is uh, uh, obviously the same trend and, and statistics. Stimulating more women um, uh, to, to engage uh, in, uh, uh, in the digital economy um, will unlock the biggest potential for the uh, faster, uh, faster uh, solution of this, uh, of this challenge. We also uh, see as a, a critical economic factor uh, the uh, growing uh, uh, digital gap uh, between women and men. Uh, and uh, this, of course, uh, uh, ex uh, add extra uh, risk uh, and the need to equip the uh, citizens of tomorrow with the uh, right skills uh, for the world tomorrow. 
Uh, and uh, obviously, the balanced teams uh, are more productive, and this is proven by the uh, by the uh, practice. Those are all factors for companies and governments to put special programs for female professional engagement, qualification and promotion in digital and digitally empowered economy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, but there is one uh, less realized factor uh, that uh, needs an active participation of women. And this is the fact that we are living in time of transformation, time of transition because of the digital connectedness, uh, the lost balance between uh, nature and people, and also because of the democratization of the access to the information. Uh, this uh, uh, leads to uh, instability and uh, uh, practically all uh, social economic systems are not able to manage anymore uh, the new world and the new reality and we are moving from a win-lose uh, um, uh, model of society to collaboration, co-creation and sharing. Next slide, please. And uh, this is manifested by the collaborative working spaces and platforms for business where competitors are working, uh, are making money because uh, uh, they are with uh, uh, together on platforms and also customers are participating in the development of the products via loyalty systems. Uh, the access to the knowledge is democratized and uh, we see in Europe, for example, a strong trend and uh, also on a policy level for opening uh, all uh, heritage, if you want, of, uh, um, of the science uh, to open scientific model under uh, Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe programs. We also uh, see people engaging uh, in global platforms uh, either for crowdsourcing uh, uh, in support of specific business or uh, social initiatives uh, through crowdfunding. So we have this uh, a very, very massive trend of collaborative attitude and thinking. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, uh, ends up into painful contradiction between the established social uh, models and the emerging new one, uh, which needs care which needs uh, uh, really a new moral foundation but uh, it needs a new type of leadership next slide please uh, women uh, have to play very very critical role in this uh, in this process uh, as leaders because of uh, being mothers because of uh, uh, knowing and have a, a an instinct how to grow new life and we are in this mode on the world and uh, uh, the approach towards uh, problem uh, situation uh, because of the inclusiveness because of the ability to build bridges because of the impact driven attitude that is incorporated in the female approach for the business but also for the social causes uh, and uh, uh, the presence of more women in the leadership will help, help us to transit uh, in a faster and less harmful way to this new reality uh, that is more and more visible for everybody. And that's another reason for us uh, to really look into the topic, not only from quotas perspective, but also on holistic way how we can engage more women. We are not there yet. Next slide, please. If we look uh, uh, in the uh, data of uh, Europe, you see uh, that uh, we have uh, less than 30% on the European board levels uh, presence of women. Uh, we have uh, significant, uh, uh, significant difference in the payment, 23% uh, less women are paid than women. And if we look who lead the world, only 11 out of uh, 195 countries uh, data last year have been uh, uh, have been uh, uh, governed by women. Next slide, please. Uh, next, yeah. Uh, if we look the European picture, 
Sixty percent uh, of the uh, is the presence of uh, uh, women in the digital economy in Bulgaria, where I'm living and where I'm coming from. Uh, we have thirty-one percent, which is uh, Europe uh, uh, Europe's uh, uh, leader, and it has it roots in the past because Bulgaria was specialized in the uh, digital economy since sixties. But next slide, please. We are also working uh, very actively uh, on uh, developing programs uh, for stimulating more women into digital economy. We have role modeling programs. Uh, we have uh, monthly meetings uh, for the women professionals where we discuss professional topics and uh, uh, the topics uh, and best practices on how uh, women in uh, uh, male-dominated and male-labeled professional environment can make career, can progress, can deal with the maternity uh, return, and so on and so far. And we have a special program five years now called Entrepre Girl that is uh, uh, addressing uh, young girls, uh, uh, 16 to 23, to uh, really make a step and to introduce their entrepreneurial ideas. So what can be done uh, in accordance with to uh, uh, really support this in a massive way? Obviously on a corporate level, driving the culture of balanced teams, balance teams, introducing quotas for women in the business, which is uh, affecting uh, more than uh, 18 countries in Europe if I remember correctly the statistics, uh, really showing positive uh, female examples and uh, uh, creating an environment for shared responsibilities between the partners in the family, which will not bridge the career of uh, women. We can uh, work remotely today, both women and men. Uh, we can uh, work 24 uh, by seven hours and uh, this should be the understanding and the uh, management should give the space and uh, most importantly today we need to raise the next generation of children uh, that have gender equality uh, um, uh, mindset next slide please uh, uh, that's why we need to uh, really uh, have a special focus on uh, uh, women in the digital era because uh, the world needs uh, more of feminine wisdom today to find uh, its new equilibrium, both in business and in social uh, sphere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. It was very interesting to actually learn about all of these uh, statistics and 700,000 jobs gap. It's an interesting one, as well as, you know, 12% um, of a digital skills gap. So to prepare women and girls for both current job in market shifts and the changes yet to come, it is essential basically to promote um, inclusiveness, digital skill and literacy, innovation, and, and everything in the framework of future, of future of work. Thank you for these insights. Um, I would like to invite the next panelist, Nicole Isak, Senior Director, North America Policy, LinkedIn. Nicole is the head of North America Policy and manages strategic engagement with local, state, provincial, and federal governments across North America. She has been with the organization for over um, four years and previously served as a director of U.S. public policy, where she managed day-to-day -day policy and government affairs portfolio, taking on primary responsibility for engaging with administration, Congress, and policy-oriented NGOs on issues ranging from privacy, security to workforce policy issues. Nicole, we are looking forward to have your insights on this topic over to you. Great, thank you everyone. It's terrific to be here and a tremendous honor to participate. Um, the first slide outlines that LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network. And when we say largest professional network, we're talking about uh, a network comprised of over 660 million individuals in approximately 198 countries around the world. We know that in the U.S. alone, we have well over 155 million individuals, over almost 10 million in Australia, 
almost another 6 million in South Africa, 90 million in Europe, and our representation is, is quite significant when accounting for individuals who are either out of the workforce, such as, such as youth or students, um, in addition to those who are retired. So when you think about LinkedIn's network, just want to provide additional context on what that looks like. The next slide that you should see outlines, again, 660 million individuals across 200 countries, and most importantly, we have 30 million companies on the platform. So we have the ability to understand what are the skill sets that an employer is hiring for, how those skill sets may have changed over a given period of time, and how employers and educators can best align their needs and their goals to create efficiency in the workforce. Um, in addition to 30 million companies, we have 20 million open jobs on the platform, and equally important, we have 90,000 institutions of higher education. And the next slide, which outlines how we share our insights to inspire action for policymakers, really is an overview of the ways in which our data can drive value at the local level. We recently partnered with the World Bank to underscore the types of skills gaps that exist in over 180 countries around the world, including, of course, developing countries. What are the skills that are most prevalent on the ground in South Africa or in Argentina or Chile? And how can those skills be better matched with the supply from employers? Um, this data is actually on the World Bank website. If you're interested in checking it out, it's linkedindata.worldbank.org. And we have an aggregated set of insights to outline not only the skills in demand, but who's moving from one locality to another to better align with those skills in demand over a given period of time. Now, the most recent report that we released with respect to gender and equity and ways in which, given the future of work, we can better align the skills in demand with the skills in supply, particularly for, for women, includes our work around APEC countries. Um, we recently released a, a report outlining the, the skill gap in five APEC countries, Australia, Canada, Malaysia, Singapore, and one area in the U.S. in particular, in the San Francisco Bay Area. We noted that based on our methodology that AI is becoming more prevalent across traditionally non-tech industries, so i.e. the use of AI in education, manufacturing, finance, and healthcare, but we also noted that programming skills are while, that, while programming skills are important, AI professionals have non-engineering backgrounds and they have to leverage soft skills to the workforce and to bring into the workplace. Um, relevant to this discussion, we noted that there is a stark gender gap in 20% of AI professionals in these five regions that I outlined are female, 20%. And when you think about the fact that 40% of the workforce in APEC countries are, is, is frankly comprised of females. The fact that you have only 20% of AI professionals be female is definitely disconcerting and leaves room for understanding what are the best ways to mitigate that type of um, inequity in the, in the workforce. One thing that we've consistently said from a LinkedIn perspective when thinking about how to better create gender balance is, one, understand what are the current gender goals of your organization and how you can strengthen your employer brand to appeal to diverse audiences. We also know that the use of data is absolutely instructive and illustrative for informing the type of goals and objectives that an employer or organization will set. And then finally, we recommend that you ensure that you are creating an outreach plan for purposes of increasing response rates by gender, particularly with respect to recruitment and retention. Um, and organizations like ours is absolutely beneficial, can be beneficial in, in helping to facilitate that. That's just a quick top line overview and look forward to the Q&A.
Thank you so much, Nicole. This is a very interesting study. Um, I have so many questions, as do um, our audience. So um, I think it's the right moment to start with uh, um, the questions. And uh, let me try to pick the first one. So um, we had this wonderful wonder overviews from policy perspective, what is here in the um, US, European Union. Um, how do generational demographics factor into anticipating and planning for new trends given the impact of sectoral and also of upcoming generation with its view? and the use, especially we are thinking about moving from millennials to Gen Y. How are you monitoring and measuring this progress? And um, in looking how the participation and the gender equality and women empowerment is in relation to the technologies. Adrian, maybe we can start with you. Uh, thank you. So, um, there are some studies underway at the moment to understand those intergenerational shifts. However, I guess we are really focused on not, not on differences between um, millennials and the younger generation, but also uh, um, around a lot of the women who are in the workforce now and who need to, um, and we think also are potential sources for picking up the new um, digital skills. And we know that once you're over 35, 40, often women are faced with a lot of kind of skepticism, whether they will be able to pick up those skills or whether they have those skills. And there's some interesting initiatives around to bring back women who used to work in um, the IT sector and left because often because they had kids and because, frankly, working conditions are not very conducive, um, you know, to have a family and um, be a, a programmer or software engineer. So I'm, I think a lot is going on to try and, and interest the new generation, but I would like us also to focus on those who are kind of out of school and in the workforce now. Nicole, what are your views? So I, I, I definitely agree that this is a space that we have to manage effectively because to the extent that we don't understand the current implications of these shifts, we'll be in a more challenging position moving forward, particularly when you think about the rise in AI, artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, automation, I, I do think, you know, from a LinkedIn perspective, we have worked to understand how data can be used to specifically account for these shifts in work, workforce demand. Um, and one particular project we did based in Canada was targeted for, for youth unemployment and ways in which you could identify uh, the top skills in demand for youth such that you could better align curriculum with those skills and demand. So I think it's something that we, we have to absolutely manage and, you know, the, the ways to do it is to increase public-private partnerships, account for educational training to better align with employer demand, but have transparency in the workforce because otherwise you won't have visibility into what, what the real-time skills that are demand tend to be. Thank you, Nicole. And Sasha, I will add a little um, question to the previous one. Joan is interesting to know. So uh, uh, there are opportunities and challenges for women who have been in the STEM uh, field for many years. And because you are doing this work for many years in this field, what about them? What about those women? Do you have a solution um, taking into consideration all of these technological uh, developments? Um, actually, there are uh, two dimensions that uh, my uh, fellow panelists uh, outlined um, uh, them. One thing is uh, what we do for the today's uh, professionals and female professionals and women that need uh, relatively fast to adapt to this new digital reality. 
Uh, second dimension is how we prepare the next generation. And from my perspective, uh, the uh, answer is one and the same. It is an education, urgent education needed. Uh, in a, uh, on a couple of levels. One thing is uh, obviously to equip uh, both in corporate level, but also in the more general social level, uh, the current professionals for uh, this new reality, uh, which means, uh, uh, which means uh, corporations and governments uh, to uh, allocate uh, um, much bigger resources uh, uh, based on the data that uh, even today on this uh, uh, on this call we've shared and to equip people with uh, the right skills and uh, uh, women um, uh, for women I've spoken even in my uh, uh, presentation it is not only about what we do uh, as uh, uh, technical programs in professional environment uh, uh, or um, on a government level. The, uh, the problem is holistic, uh, uh, needs holistic solution and uh, holistic approach. And uh, we should uh, uh, really look uh, uh, and mobilize and engage from all these levels. Second thing, uh, yeah. Sorry, okay. I'm, I'm trying to uh, to have short responses so I can get many questions as possible. I will uh, let you finish the, the photo. No, I'm uh, just uh, sorry for being uh, very long. I made a second speech, but uh, the uh, for the next generation, I would not. Uh, um, I'm less worrying, honestly, because uh, uh, the next generation is digitally native. And uh, both girls and boys uh, are playing with technology. Uh, the point is, uh, governments to put this equal, uh, the gender um, uh, neutral education um, in uh, the educational system, and uh, Finland uh, is a very, very good example in that area. Thank you. A very interesting question we have from Ihsan. How do you, we expect the women in low risk sectors like healthcare in geographic areas with a high concentration of high risk jobs? Um, what will be the effect? Uh, I think in general, it will be interesting to understand your views about the sectorial approach and the development. Um, Adrian? To, to whom is the question? Um, I would like uh, Arian, or we can start with uh, you, Sasha, whatever, whoever wants to give a response. Um, very briefly, I think that uh, we should um, uh, really calculate the fact that uh, every sector is digital and the whole economy is digitally empowered and to uh, take the right uh, measures to equip uh, doctors, uh, uh, lorry drivers, uh, and everybody with the right basic and specialized digital skills. And this is a, a, a program that business uh, plus government should run together. Um, this is Aria. Uh, I agree, and I think there are some really interesting initiatives in the United States um, around using cell phones and um, you know uh, digital programs to reach out, say, to women who do elder care service or to lower level staff in the healthcare sector. Uh, and one of our issues is that, um, you know, the need for digital literacy is really growing in those. But uh, even though if you can make that learning available to women so they can do it when and where they have time, they will have less time on average than men. So we cannot just expect that women learn all these skills in their own time. But I think technology offers really um, exciting new opportunities to complement digital with kind of in-person training. Thank you, Ariane. Nicole, I do have another question for you. Um, there are issues with artificial intelligence having gender bias. 
Um, our, panel, uh, our participants are asking, are any of your initiatives designed to address those? No, I appreciate the question. I will say as a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Microsoft, which has invested a significant amount of resources, as well as research into ways in which we can reduce bias through our applications and products, I, I think LinkedIn is, is definitely at the cutting edge on this because we are working to ensure that, you know, there's a level of assessment of algorithms that, that would create a particular set of representation in and out of a user's interface, but that there is an assessment and a level of um, just review, both independent and internal, to ensure that we are not subscribing to the many ways in which AI can increase um, bias for particular candidates. And, and I think it's really incumbent upon companies to, one, increase their internal and external review mechanism to do so, two, to understand the industry, industry standards with which they can create a baseline for reducing bias, particularly from AI and, and machine learning, and then three, understand what are some of the regulatory changes coming down the pike with respect to compliance in this space, and, and that really requires working with legislators. Was that a helpful background, or did you guys want me to clarify further? It was a very helpful background. Um, thank you so much, Nicole. You anticipated my next question, um, and I would like to also uh, ask uh, you, Sasha and Ariane, to also include your comments in general on this topic, since this will be the last one. What historical examples can we look uh, for successful policy responses to past wave of automation that can be implemented or could, could be taken as a good examples. And we speak here also about the relationship with all the institutions and the actors, government, private sector, civil society. It will be interesting to know your opinion. Um, Ariane, maybe we can start with you. <laughs> well, thank you. That is a big broad question. Um, so thinking on my feet, I, I think um, the responses um, that were developed to the decline in manufacturing um, in the, you know, 80s and 90s, and um, if you take particularly some economies like Denmark or so, focusing very much on a kind of speedy response with well-supported workforce development, a, um, you know, we're going to have huge opportunities for reducing the time we spend at work to reduce working hours and make it possible um, to have a kind of both a family life and a work life. And I think there, again, from Europe, there are a lot of examples um, there. And finally, I think we are still in the middle of this, but some countries have made much more progress than others in tackling the imbalance in care work to get men more involved. And I think a lot of our challenges in, in the future are focused on what men can do and do not do, not just on what women, where women are underrepresented. Thank you so much, Ariane. Sasha, maybe you yeah <laughs> now i am admitted so um, obviously a uh, lot can has been done already in the last 20 years uh, on a big corporate level uh, there have been uh, lots of different programs to stimulate and support female uh, female leadership female uh, engagement uh, with um, uh, limited uh, access success and uh, it is very, very critical uh, behind those initiatives to stand uh, men in power. And this is uh, something uh, that uh, possibly can be uh, further improved. But still, I remember in my HP times, uh, 
we've managed uh, through different uh, programs in HP to increase number of uh, female uh, uh, presence for about uh, uh, five years in a clearly IT company uh, from 29 to 37 percent, which is a lot. And uh, uh, what can be done on a more systematic level, uh, again, coming to really addressing the prejudices in the society, which has the biggest factors, because we, uh, we see women uh, that uh, are self-limiting uh, to, uh, to, to go into digital economy, to take roles that are digitally heavy, uh, to really participate uh, uh, on leadership level in those roles is uh, uh, to uh, work with uh, changing the perceptions via media, uh, also uh, to quotas on boards, very successful uh, history of, in Europe from 2004 uh, in uh, uh, till now. And uh, uh, also to, as a temporary measure, uh, I would say, but we don't have time to go into this. And uh, uh, also to work with the next generation again uh, to, to grow uh, women and men, which are very good uh, examples we have uh, on a pilot levels uh, from Europe. And um, uh, as I said, only with the Entrepreneur program that I've mentioned of uh, Bulgarian Center of Women in Technologies, we have as a result for five years, uh, 200 uh, new female-led uh, businesses that has been started. So it is possible, but it requires uh, uh, really uh, continuous efforts. Thank you so much, Sasha. Nicole, over to you. Sure, I, I agree with, with everything that, that's already been said with respect to paid leave, examining how women are coming both in and out of the workforce, how they tend to be the, the larger number proportionately of caregivers in society and examining what are the benefits that are typically offered for women as they re-enter the workforce. Um, one interesting example I think we've had in the U.S. In with respect to how we've created significant public-private partnerships to support re-entry for veterans. And I, I think to the extent that we could identify what are some of the best practices for another segment and then examine the extent to which some of those best practices can be replicated given, this, given the unique challenges that women may face because of their position as you know, the, the individuals who tend to be most focused on caregiving or, or having to take a, a certain amount of leave for family, I do think it, it is timely for us to evaluate what are the possible partnerships that can best facilitate that. So when you think about either joining forces as a, a great model, um, increasing the number of corporate commitments to hire X amount of individuals who haven't been in the workplace given their skill sets. Also taking a, a unique overview of what are what are the backgrounds and characteristics that women can provide given their experiences. I, I think it's incumbent on us to do so. So those would be my, my top recommendations in conjunction with our with what has already been said. Thank you so much, Nicole. I think one thought throughout um, is clear. All of new technologies will likely reduce the number of jobs. Digitalization has the potential to generate new jobs through the Internet of Things, robotics, and application of um, artificial intelligence. So we, we are looking forward to um, have um, many other discussions where we can identify good examples and to work together with our stakeholders and partners into creating this change and to implement concrete recommendations. Um, I would like to say that we received many positive uh, comments comments and a lot of questions, a lot. I'm sorry we don't have um, a time for everything. We also received some invitations for the panelists uh, for some uh, well, uh, podcasts, so we'll be happy to share those. Um, many comments saying, uh, I am learning so much. And um, this is uh, just to say thank you to our panelists. 
Um, and for the closing remarks, since we spoke a lot about the G7 countries and EU, I would like to invite my colleagues, um, Christine Hafford, who is coordinating uh, the We Empower program activities in US, to share her views and um, her thoughts on the topic and maybe a little bit about the upcoming activities. Christine, over to you. Great, thank you, Diana, and thank you so much um, to all of our panelists. I want to um, echo my my thanks to Ariane, Nicole, and Sasha. This is um, this is really the kind of discussion that we will continue to have as part of our U.S. program um, between the private sector and policymakers and um, civil society organizations working on these issues because we really um, we're really looking to find out what solutions and um, all of the thinking that all of you are doing and how we can can coordinate across stakeholders to really tackle these issues in a um, a really forward thinking way so we really appreciate everything you've shared today um, and and we'll continue this transatlantic discussion as well and and also work with our other g7 partners because um, I think as Diana said in the beginning uh, the we empower program is a is a program focused on g7 countries um, and women's economic empowerment in those countries so um, our next uh, event that we are planning will be, uh, we'll go, it'll drill deeper down into um, the issue of women and this and inclusive innovation. And um, we will we will be having a, an event in partnership with the Nordic Innovation House in Silicon Valley uh, on the campus of Stanford University, uh, September 25th and 26th. Um, and we will, so we'll be with our European partners there. Uh, and then we'll continue, we plan to have events throughout the country, throughout the end of this year and into next year um, in the Midwest, in the Southwest, Northeast. Uh, so we will continue to post those on empowerwomen.org where we have both our upcoming activities but also uh, publications um, by our partners, as well as toolkits and other um, uh, other resources that we are creating as a part of our We Empower project. Um, so, uh, finally, I'll just say again, we are we're thrilled to have uh, found many companies that we're working with to sign on to the Women's Empowerment Principles, which underscores the entire We Empower project. And so, we have Canadian partners, U.S. companies. Um, Japanese who are signing on to seven core principles that really commit to many of the issues that we're talking about today that that really help companies have a roadmap for how to address creating a more inclusive workforce and um, an and a workforce that really promotes gender equality um, and holds them accountable and so I appreciate this discussion because it really speaks to the the multitude of areas that that our project is looking at um, whether it's you know the recruitment and retention piece or the care piece or flexibility um, build the, the actual building of the technology itself and and of course the policy piece and anticipating um, where this you know where we need to where we need to be thinking about these issues and collaborating with each other. So we look forward to having more companies sign on and um, we really appreciate the leadership that the three of you have taken today to share your vision for the work that you're all doing. Um, and I will turn it back over to my colleague, um, Diana, and thank uh, again the EU for um, uh, sponsoring this, this program across the G7 countries and the opportunity to have this webinar today. Thank you so much, Kristen. And I think it's only um, even more important that we talk about all of uh, this today. Um, since we speak about it in the margins of a G7 summit in Biarritz, um, 
I wanted to share with all our participants that uh, we already have on empowerment.org the um, recommendation provided by the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council to the G7 um, uh, states. And this includes end gender based violence, ensure equitable and quality education and health, promote economic empowerment, which includes also the technology and artificial intelligent policies and recommendation and also ensure full equality between women and men in public policies. Please take a look. Uh, you have it under recordings, uh, 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 under resources, I'm sorry. Uh, the next webinar uh, will be on the 5 September. 10 a.m. and we will talk about parental leave and um, parent smart companies. Um, we will share the recording and the presentation as a follow-up email. But also, we do appreciate always your thoughts, and we will like to run very quick two um, questions um, just to see after the webinars if you. Um, I informed uh, with uh, with uh, policies. Did it help the information? Um, please take a, a vote and um, please let us know how satisfied are you with the uh, information received. It will take you exactly several seconds, but it will be a very good feedback for us to know in future what to improve um and what type of uh, discussion to have ten more seconds and i will close thank you so much um we appreciate your positive feedback if you have any particular suggestions on the topics, or if you would like to become a speaker in our webinars, um, please let us know. We are always welcome uh, your inputs and uh, um, the collaboration. With this said, I know we are a little bit over the time, but I would like to thank so much our panelists. And um, also I would like to thank the um, European um, uh, union um, and the uh, international labor organization for um, for working together with us within we empower program and also i would like to thank institute for women's policy research uh, for this collaboration we appreciate a lot um, your participation until next time thank you so much thank you for being with us um, this is the end of our webinar